so welcome and thank you again for joining us. Uh, I would like to say thank you to all of our co-sponsors. So obviously Sunstone Engineering, because these guys are the ones that have provided the welders. Um, there's also a conference that's micro welding. If you guys wanna know more about it, that is held in Orlando, Florida. Um, that's at the end of September. So if you guys want to check out some more information there, make sure you check out the Sunstone uh, website for that. We also want to thank Microtools, Kurt Fargo at Microtools and the uh, Fordham Electric Group as well as Kevin Potter and his whole crew. So they've all worked together to put this together for us. And so as we go through, you'll start to see some of those. All right, so with that said, I think we should go ahead and just jump on in. Here is the pendant that I have created and I'm going to be showing you. Now, one of the things I wanna point out really quickly on this, this is something that the welder allows me to do that I wouldn't have the opportunity to do otherwise. Notice how I have a very large piece sitting over my stone. So if you look at this, the question then is, how did you set the stone? Or if I were to set my stone, how do I solder this part into place? And I don't. And that's where the welder really comes in and shines for me. It allows me to do much more complex work. In addition, this is all sterling silver. And you might've seen some of the other pieces that I've done that are copper and silver. Copper and silver are the two hardest materials to weld together. So um, that, that is a thing. They are so heat conductive. And you're gonna see in the video, I wear gloves and it gets really hot, really hot to the point where it will burn me through the gloves. So every now and then I have to kind of put it down, let it rest and cool back down. So let's jump into this. So first thing we're gonna do is I need to create the bezel for my stone. In this case, my stone is actually a very odd shaped stone on the top the dome is not even and so I have to make some modifications that you guys will see coming up here so here I'm just going through and I'm going to put the solder I wanted to place a, enough solder my bezel is actually pretty tall so I wanted enough solder that I knew I was gonna have some pretty good coverage in this case I'm just using a little hand torch just a little butane one so nothing major this is a silhouette die that I have created. I made it from scratch. I used a PVC sheet and 14 gauge uh, yellow brass to create this. Now this sheet that's, that you guys see with this beautiful pattern on it, that is a pattern from Potter USA. So it's one that I just rolled through the rolling mill. In this case, it's sterling. You'll see up in the upper right corner, there's a copper piece. That was a test piece. I wanted to test both the pattern and my die. And then over here to the left, you're gonna start to see some of my drawings that I did. So this is the stone that I'm using. And I think that this is gonna be a beautiful pattern. I put and I traced out. And the reason I traced this onto my sheet is I wanted to make certain that I had enough space and then also to kind of get a visual of how things are going to lay out. So here I played with a couple of different ideas. This one on the right, you can see that's actually the one I decided to use that would have one spot that overlays and then I have the bezel that's gonna swing. Now this one would have two spots that would overlay my stone and again I would do the bezel but I decided to go with the one here on the right so first thing I've got is just a sheet of silver now this is already annealed okay and that's important because when it comes time to forming that then I need to have that so now I've got it kind of laid out and now I've got to decide where I'm going to draw my design so I just give myself kind of a, a visual right there with my marker this is modeling clay but what it does you can see it puts a film on my metal and then with a pencil I can come in and draw and if I mess up all I do is rub it off with my finger come back in with the clay and dab it back on again to give me another surface and then that way I can come in and draw my little design and again it's super simple because if I mess up all I have to do is just wipe it off dab it again and then draw the new design so that's approximately the design that we're going to go with on this so here I have mounted this onto a block with hot glue okay so it's just hot glue and I'm using a flat graver 
This is in a ball vise, that's why I'm able to rotate this around so easily. But this is what is called a flare cut. So I make a cut one direction and I turn it around and I cut in the opposite direction. And that actually brings the middle of those two cuts, they meet at a peak inside. And what that does is gives me a really, really flashy look to uh, the design on my piece. And where it's silver, I mean, it just pops beautifully. The graver is highly polished, which will leave a highly polished finish uh, as well. So, and I just, I don't know, I love this part. I love watching this. This is sped up at about 800 times. So this is quite a bit faster than it actually happens. So once I have it, I just kind of uh, remove any of the ever uh, surface scratches. Now I'm gonna put it into the die and I'm gonna form it, but I don't want it to shift. So I'm gonna tape it on both sides of this. If you only tape it on one side, it will actually kind of drag in on the free side, so I wanna secure it pretty well. When you put it into the hydraulic press, make certain that it is completely centered. You don't wanna have it off to the side or anything like that, and this is gonna give you the best pressure. In this case, I took this up to about 3,500 pounds. I didn't wanna to go too high, otherwise I run the risk of popping this. But because I have already engraved it, I only get one shot at this, so I need to get the depth uh, I need to get it right the first time. And there is our piece. So now I'm gonna cut out the inside. Here's something I wanna point out. Notice that my saw is not straight up and down. Okay, when we use our jeweler saw, we are always told to keep our saw straight up and down. And you'll see sometimes it is going to be straight up and down, but most of the time it's not. And what I'm trying to do is keep my saw cut perpendicular, not just up to the piece, but to the shape of the piece. And because my piece is shaped, then I need to, and here you can really see that angle that I'm at. Okay, you can see that right there. And I'm trying to keep it perpendicular to the metal at that angle. Okay, now, and you can see I wasn't perfect on that, so I have a bunch of cleanup to do. So this is where I'll bring in some different files. Here I'm using some needle files. This is sped up again, you guys, about 800%, so I wish we could go that fast. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> But anyway, so I'm gonna spend some time here and I'm gonna clean up these edges a lot. Uh, I used a number two and a number four file as far as their cut goes, so that's how gritty or fine they are. Notice that the file, I push it in. Files will only cut in one direction. So this is now the back plate. I didn't show the forming of that because it's the same as forming the front, but now we're gonna form, or now we're gonna do the back. Now here, I make a mistake, right here, right there. I cut it all the way down to the shape itself, and then I realized it, and I was like, oh yeah, whoops, I need to be out a little bit. I actually want to leave a little bit of excess material on this. By leaving some excess material when I weld it, it gives me some metal to actually weld together. So I do have that one little spot that was cut perfectly at the edge, but the rest of it I leave a little bit of a flange. And so now I kind of test this out, and I need to now solder in my bezel. I could weld that, but I don't. I like the join and the cleanness of the solder on this. So you'll see in my pieces, I use soldering and welding together a lot, okay? So notice that I put this on a nest and that's because I wanna come and bring that heat from underneath. And I actually put a lot of solder in this guy because I just wanted to make sure I had a really good joint. I also put it on the inside of my bezel because I don't want it spreading on the outside of my bezel and the inside is gonna be hidden by my stone. And there we watch that solder flow. It's the best thing in the studio, isn't it? Oh, I love watching that. Okay, so I'm gonna cut out the top piece. And again, I'm leaving a flange, okay? I've left a lot of excess material. In this case, I've left a little too much and, I, and I'm gonna have to take care of that. I rub this on sandpaper because I want a nice flat surface. And so if you test it, look at that, you can see everything is nice and even we've got a flat spot. And that is going to allow me to put those two pieces together. All right, so now we have the beginning of our piece. 
Not too bad, huh? Okay, so I'm gonna pause here really quick and um, let's answer any questions that you guys might have. Is the nest binding wire? Yes, I use a stainless steel binding wire for that. And it's nice because it will kind of get these oxides that come onto it and that will help it from soldering onto your piece if solder happens to flow down into there. So that would be, hopefully that kind of helps you there. Um, what gauge of silver? So in this case, I am using, I believe 20 gauge silver, which is uh, 0.8 millimeters for those of you guys that use that metric system. And, um, and both sides on this one were 20 gauge, which is 0.8 millimeters. Uh, as far as the borax that I dipped it in, that is a mixture of 50% borax to 50% denatured alcohol. And that's way I can protect the, the surface of my silver a little bit better from getting any kind of fire scale. Uh, as far as my solder, about 98% of the time I use hard solder. So both of those solder seams that you just saw, and that's it. Th that's all the solder that is used in this piece. Uh, but it's hard solder. I, I like hard solder because what happens, so first of all, hard solder has the highest silver content okay, of all of the solders. And it has all of these different components that have been alloyed into it to help lower its melting temperature. Well, what happens with solder is when you flow that solder, its melting temperature will go up a little bit. So if I bring in new pieces of solder that's hard, its melting temperature is here, but my original one that's already flowed is up here now. So as this one flows, it'll catch up to this. Now it's a split second thing, but it, this will flow first. Okay, the new solder. So um, keep that in mind when you use it. And that's why, like I said, 98% of the time I use hard solder because that little differentiation of that new solder flowing first. So I have easy, or I've got medium and easy in my studio, but they rarely get used. Um, let's see. Okay, so Vincent says that he likes to tack his bezel uh, to the back plate. There are times that I do that. That is a very good point. If there is a specific position that I need, I will just put it on a lower wattage and then just tack that into place. That's one of the things I really like about having the welders is that you can go in and you can tack together more complex designs and then it'll hold while you do your soldering operations. So that is a way that I use this welder a lot also. All right, so Lisa says she's disappointed because she thought I was gonna close the bezel using the welder. So how much soldered versus welded? Like I said, you have now seen all of the soldered part on this piece. And I don't find that I replace my soldering with welding. To me, they are a good marriage together. So I can still solder some elements and then I can weld other elements. And then the other thing too, uh, is that when I do my welding, I don't have to worry about damaging my stones or anything like that. And then, like I said, I'm able to create more complex things that might cover up my stone that would have made my stone impossible to set had I done it another way, or it would have been impossible to solder had I tried to do that as well. So those are a couple of different things there. Um, so Nardine, how do I determine the settings of the Orion with the different gauges between the wire and sheet? We're actually gonna look at some of that coming up here pretty quick, but a lot of times it is a trial and error. So you, you'll see how I kind of tackle that. So let's jump back over to this video really quick. Um, can you weld pieces with enamel? Absolutely. Yes, you can. Um, I've done it many times. I've had students that have done it with great success. You just need to have that. You need to have a clean margin that you can weld together. So if you're welding something on the edges of a piece that's enameled, you know, I've done stuff like that a lot. So, all right, so let me share this back over here for you guys and we'll continue. Okay, so here I'm, I'm gonna finish cutting out different things. So the stone that I have for this is so pretty, front and back, so I wanted to pop out the back on this as well. And this is where some of that cleanup comes back in. So again, I'm gonna come in with my file, but that will sometimes leave kind of a rough surface. So here I'm using a gray silicone wheel or 
accessory um you know just a grinding bit this one happens to be a cylinder and i can just come in and smooth down any of those file marks that were left and here i kind of recognize that my surface wasn't quite as even as i thought so i go back in with the file and then i'm going to follow that back up with that cylinder wheel now or the cylinder accessory now the cylinder accessory is great but it cannot get me into that point Okay, that point is pretty tight. So here I'm gonna to switch to a red one, which is a little bit finer grit, but it also had the point. Now, that shape is available in the gray one. I just don't have it here in my studio. So this was one step finer and I figured that that would still work. And I'm just going to touch up my bezel just to make sure everything looks nice and even. So now, remember I told you my stone was really off shaped. Can you see that? Like it dips down there at the edge and now it's back up to a high spot. So I use a marker to trace out along the top of the stone on the inside of my bezel. Now I have a couple of options here. I can either lift my stone or I can drop the bezel. And I don't usually drop my bezels. I don't usually grind them down, but in this case I'm going to. Now this is a carbide carving tip, okay? And this is something that I get from Fordham. Now this is a newer product, so they may not have it out on their website yet. I know that they were in the process of getting some of them ordered. This is extremely aggressive and you have to be very, very careful and you have to have a good hold on your piece. Otherwise it will run away. Okay, you know how like you get some bits that will grab and then just kind of skitter away. This will do that in a heartbeat. So I have to be really careful with how I'm holding everything. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grind down to that line that I have drawn. And I'm gonna go around the entire bezel because the entire bezel needs some alterations. This side is still a little high, but this side over here, this is where it gets really low. So I'm gonna have to grind away quite a bit. And it does create a little bit of a burst, so you see that I come back in and just kind of go at a 45 degree angle. See, this is the one right there where I have to really go deep on this. Now the other thing, I don't want to leave this all wavy and wonky. So you'll see that I'm gonna address that here pretty quick. But you'll also see that what I do is I'll do a bit of grinding and I'm gonna pop my stone back in, test it, see where I need to make some more modifications. And you know, because I already have a line on the inside, now I'm gonna draw on the top. And this shows me where I need to concentrate some more of that grinding effort. Cause I don't need to do the whole thing this time. Now I just need to concentrate on a few pieces. So in this case at the top and down here on the bottom. So once again, I just come in, grind that away. And then I go back in because I've now got that burr on the inside. So I just go back in with that and knock it down a little bit. But you can see like things are now getting to be a little bit bumpy and une uneven. So I'm going to take my file. This is just the flat file. And I just want to kind of smooth things uh, so that they blend well, because you don't even realize that the stone isn't even. Okay. And you would if your bezel is all wavy. And so here, I still have a pretty high peak. My, my stone takes a dive there at that point. So I'm gonna take that, color it back in, test everything else. Everything else is actually looking pretty decent at this point. So finish grinding this, and then I'm gonna go back in with that file one more time and just smooth everything there on the top. Okay, so now this is where I just blend everything. And that way we've got smooth, a smooth bezel that works all the way around. And like I said, when you look at this, you don't even realize now that the stone wasn't completely symmetrical and even. So it's kind of nice. All right, so from here, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna go mount this onto my ball vise. And in order to do that, I've gotta have some kind of, so everything right there is looking really good. I just double check the height of that bezel. And you wanna have a little bit higher, obviously. You need to have enough to set your stone, okay? Okay, so now we're ready, maybe. <laughs> Sometime here, there we go. So now we're gonna head over here. This is Thermalock. Now Thermalock loves to stick to your metals. And so this is a tip that I learned off of one of my friends on Instagram. She puts foil onto the Thermalock and then we'll set her piece into there. And now it's not gonna stick to my piece. So that's kind of a 
cool little tip that I learned from her. But I will say it also makes it kind of difficult because sometimes your piece can still move. So you need to make sure you really get it pushed into place so you'll see that I pushed that stuff over. Now here I'm using my hammer hand piece on my, this one happens to be my micro motor, but it would work the same way with a flex shaft. Notice that I, I concentrate on this point first. Okay, you always set your corners first anytime you have points. And then I'm gonna go ahead and lock the rest of the stone in with just a couple of little pushes. And then once you have that, then you can really come back in and start to lay everything down. So they're nice and smooth. And I love the hammer hand piece for this. I remember I was used to hand set, you know, just with a hand push uh, for all of my bezels. And it worked great, you know? And then I learned how to do it with a hammer and a punch. But I will tell you, nothing beats it doing it with either your micro motor or your flex shaft with this hammer hand piece. I mean, it's so smooth and easy. Now the point, that anvil point that I'm using, it's rounded, I did have to alter that. So just be aware when you get those, you do have to alter those. And I have videos that show you how to do that, both by hand or by using a jewel tool. And here I'm gonna just clean up my bezel edge and I'm working pretty close up to my stone right here. This is a rubber accessory. This is probably my favorite accessory, especially if I'm looking at it under a microscope, I just can watch all of the little scratches just disappear and go away. So it works out really, really nice. And you guys can see that there's some little hammer marks right there on the bezel. You can see that. And so I go back around with this wheel and I can just blend all of those back in together. And I don't believe I recorded that part, but you can blend everything together. Now here I am using platinum white on a horsehair brush. So this horsehair brush is pretty soft and platinum white is kind of like, um, maybe like white diamond or Tripoli, where it's a little bit abrasive. So again, it will help remove some of those scratches, but because it's also on a soft brush, it will help me get that pre-polish that I'm after. Uh, and then I could go back in with a felt wheel or I could go back in with a cotton buff if I want to and really take that to a high polish. So here I've just softened up that Thermalock and then just show you now it doesn't stick to my piece. So I wanted to pop the design on the inside of this, this piece here. So I'm using this Jack Silver Blackner. And sometimes it, you have to work it a little bit because it doesn't always want to put everything on. This is one of those nail buffs, okay? One side is a little bit abrasive and then the other side has like where it'll take your fingernails to a really high shine. But I like this because it's stiff. And so I'm able to work it just along the highlights of my piece rather than having it get down and remove even the low portions because I wanted to leave that low portion nice and dark. Okay, and now I'm taking that high shine part and I'm running it, running it against the stone and the bezel and it just puts everything such a high bright shine, it's lovely. Okay, here we are, we're gonna start doing our welding. It's important that you start with a clean electrode. Okay, so, and then you also want your electrode to be in the proper position in order for you to do this. Now, what do I do for my settings? I don't know. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off here by saying I'm gonna create the seam, I'm working with silver, turn my weld on. I know I need more than 15 watts. I know that already. So I'm just gonna pick a number. In this case, I believe I picked 30. Okay, 30 watts, and I'm taking two pieces of scrap. One came off of the top, one came off of the bottom. These are the parts that I cut away. And I use this to get my settings. So I'll come in here, there's the first tack, and then I'll make a few welds, and I'll look at that, and I can see, you know, it, do I, it, does it go deep enough? Did I still have a seam? This will clear up in just a second. I know this part's blurry, sorry. But now I can look at my weld, and I can see, that everything lays together pretty nicely there. And I'm like, okay, let's start with that. So here I'm at 30 watts and I'm gonna create my tack welds. My tack welds are just gonna hold these two pieces together for me so that I can uh, weld the rest of the piece together. So everything's kind of nice. I do have the little clip, you just create or clip that onto your piece that is necessary to 
complete the circuit from the welder to your piece of metal. All right, so now I have three welds on here. Okay, they're very light, but it doesn't take much, and it will hold everything together. So again, right now I'm set at 30, okay? And I'm just gonna go in and I'm putting one weld next to the next, to the next, to the next. Now this is sped up just a little bit, and that was not enough. So I'm like, okay, let's bump this up to 50. And now you can see like my welds are starting to pull a little bit. It's not as smooth as it was when it was at 30. Okay, it's starting to get a little bit bumpy in there. And I am holding this and it is getting hot, especially as you go from one weld to the next and you lay them right next to each other like that, your piece gets very, very, very hot. And I'm not, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> you have to put it down several times to do it. So I'm gonna kind of look at that and I'm like, all right, well, I'm definitely getting a deep enough weld, you know, but maybe it's gonna make too much of a mess. I don't know. So this is at 400 speed. Okay, notice that I'm starting to get some splatters. See that? Okay, there's a couple things going on here. One, my tip is starting to get dirty. Okay, so if my electrode is dirty, I'm not gonna get as good of a weld. And then I also have too much energy. Remember, I'm at 50 here. Okay, so I'm getting, I've got too much energy. As my piece warms up and it gets hot, I actually don't need as much energy when I'm working copper and silver. So here, I'm gonna drop this down and I'm gonna take it down to about 45. And we're gonna try it one more time and see if that, if that makes a difference, okay? So, and before I do, I've got too much excess material. So I left excess, but now I have too much. I want some, because when I go to weld things together, sometimes I'll actually have to bring a wire in and introduce it to my metal and give it a little bit extra. But in this case, I already have extra, but I have too much. There we go, we want only about a millimeter is really all we need. And then that will give me enough material to bring down and create a really good solid join on these pieces, okay? So now we're back to it. Again, I'm at 45 here and I'm still not liking the wattage. I'm still getting some splatters. So now I'm gonna take it down to 40. I just don't show that part. But that now we're at 40 and things are looking much better. There's still a couple little bit of splatters, all right? But 40 is still giving me a nice deep weld. And when I go back over it, I'm able to smooth them out. So now things lay kind of nice. Here I wanted to just double check my setting, make sure that's really working because maybe I didn't like what was happening on my piece. So I keep that test piece pretty close by. All right, and now again, I'm getting ready to go. And I just place one weld to the next, to the next, to the next. So 400 speed here. <laughs> I wish it was that fast. However, there are a couple of settings on here that you can do that will make it go almost as fast, if not faster than this. And it's a lovely setting. You can tell it how many welds to do per second. Um, I think you can go up to three or four welds per second, but I find that two, two is usually pretty good. Here it is, two welds per second. And this is real time. So boom, 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 boom. And I love it. And my welds, they just go right next to each other. And that's gonna give me a beautiful bead along the edge of my piece. And I can see, you know, and I know it's hard to see here on the video, but when I'm looking through the microscope on this, I can actually see that metal just melding together. It's really cool to watch. All right, so here I'm just continuing along around the piece. Like I said, it's so fun to watch, I love this. So now is our real test. I'm gonna use this little belt sander. This just hooks up to my number 30 hand piece on my uh, Fordham, on my flex shaft. And it's just a little belt sander. It comes with all these different grits. So this one is probably 150 grit. And what I'm doing is just sanding away those weld surfaces. 
And this is, like I said, where you're really going to have your test because if your weld was not deep enough, you're gonna find it right here, okay? If you have any pits or if you have any dings, you're gonna find them right here. All right, so I'm gonna again pause our video. Let's come back over and see if we have any other questions that you guys might have. Let's answer some of those. Um, all right, so it looks like somebody has uh, been working or asking what the electrode is. It is a tungsten. So this is a micro TIG welder. TIG is a tungsten inert gas. Now the inert gas that I use here is argon. So I have an argon tank just to the side of my little bench that has my welder right here. Um, argon is nice because it is one that's not it's not combustible or anything like that, but it gives us that shielding gas to kind of keep the oxidation at bay, much like flux does when we are soldering some of that. Um, and then Dean Elizabeth asked, no danger to the stone during welding? In this case, no. I mean, I guess you could if you get your piece too hot, but I get my pieces really hot and there's no damage to any of my stones. So I've had great, great success on that. Um, they, people are asking about, um, the, let's see here quick, um, eye protection. So I'm looking through a microscope and that microscope is going to auto darken for me. So when it has one of those welds go off, it auto darkens much like you would have with a welder's helmet or welder's glasses that do that auto darkening. Um, let's see. Uh, really quick. Sorry guys, I'm just trying to do some of these. Do both of the pieces need to be clipped? Like with that little clip that I have, like if you're welding a smaller item onto a larger item, it's really only one. You just have to have that circuit completed. Matter of fact, you're gonna see here in just a minute, I'm not gonna clip it at all. I'm actually just gonna hold it against the metal. Okay, and that is still gonna be enough to create that circuit. I don't wanna clip it because I already have a good finish on my piece, and so I don't want to ruin that. Um, and then as far as how far out to leave that electrode, so some people are saying that they don't have those set, you know, you don't have this little marking that is on, on this. However, it's still, it's basically to this little line right here where it stops. So from here to here is really where it goes. Um, mine just happens to have that little mark on it that makes it really easy. But even if it didn't, you know, you can just use those rings that kind of lock it into place as your guide. Um, okay. Will the Orion pulse arc do the same things. So all of these are pulse arc welders. Just so you know, there are four different machines. You have your impulse, impulse 30. That says that we've got 30 joules, 30 watts that we're working with. Okay, that's not a whole lot. This will not work on the impulse. It just doesn't have enough. However, the next step up is the 100C. Um, and on that one, you've got 100 watts. You've got the 100, you got the 150S, which takes it to 150, and then I have the 200I. Now the difference between these machines and these, these other three machines, the 100, the 150, and the 200, they will all have the capability of doing what I'm doing here. The thing that happens with them is that you get finer and finer settings that you can do with this. So I have some settings that will make it so that I can make that weld super smooth, okay? By changing my agitation, by changing the length of my weld, by changing the, the uh, shape, of the arc that I get. You may not have those settings on the lower machines, but you will still have enough power to do them and you'll just have a little bit more cleanup. So that's one of the things that uh, you'll have with that. Um, let's see other questions really quick. Can we clean the tip with a file without having to remove it from the handle? Um, I would remove it. I, I think, or I, I'm assuming you're talking about the electrode. I would pull the electrode out, clean it off, make it sharp. Um, I don't think I would leave it on the machine to do that. Cause not only that, but your electrode's going to get shorter as you do this right now. I will tell you guys, I weld quite a bit and I think I'm on my second 
maybe my third electrode. So they're going to last a while. All right. Um, and then Janet says, what do I mean by deep? I, I can't give you like an exact measurement, but when I mean deep, when I have a deep weld, I know that both of my pieces are welded together and it's not just a surface weld. So it's not like I'm going to hit it with a file or sandpaper and I've already gotten through it. I'm going to be able to go down a little bit. And when I go down to make that surface smooth, because you saw as I welded everything kind of, you get this rippled effect. Like think about a really good good weld join that you've seen on a piece of bar stock or something like that, right? You can see that. And so when you grind those flat, if I run into a pit or a hole, then I didn't have a deep enough weld. But if I can take and file and sand my whole piece flat, that whole seam, and not have a pit or a hole, that's a good deep weld. Okay, and that's what I mean by deep, but I can't tell you like how deep that is because it's, it's inside of my piece. So I can't tell you if it's like a millimeter, if it's half a millimeter, I'm not, I, I don't know. Um, now, does it affect, does the heat affect the patina? It can, it totally can. Um, and again, I can control that because I don't have to keep welding to the point where my piece gets so hot right? I can do a few welds, put it down, do something, come back, do a few welds, put it down, do something. In my case, I'm like, oh, whatever. I can just push through it. So I just keep going, even though I'm burning my fingers. And like I said, I do wear, I do wear gloves. So I just bought some leather gloves and I mean, you guys can see, look at them. They're like, <laughs> They totally look like they've been welding, but um, those will help protect your skin as well. And when it gets too hot for me, I just put it down at that point, but I don't have to take it to the point where it gets hot. And the weld, the heat from the weld, if I do it that way, definitely will not affect my stone, definitely will not affect my patina, okay? Because I won't be getting it quite that hot. <laughs> How often do we have to clean the electrode and do you have to remove it each time to clean? Yes, I remove it every time to clean it. So that was kind of answered a little bit before. How often do I clean it? I don't clean mine often enough. Matter of fact, I think I would have had much better welds on this piece had I pulled it off and cleaned it occasionally. Because you'll see, like, and even if you watched the video, and if you watch, because I've got a couple more welds that are gonna happen here pretty quick, look at my electrode. It looks like it's got this little speckled silver fog on it or a haze that should be clean. And if I clean that, I'm going to get better welds. So it's up to you. Again, I'm one of those that I'm like, ah, I can push through, even though I know I'm not going to have as good of a weld because it's going to fire a little bit differently. It kind of disperses that, that arc a little bit differently than if you have a nice clean weld. So I would clean it as often as possible. Okay. Or, and especially if you're noticing that you're having a really hard time with a weld when it was doing beautifully before, that's one of your tips right there. Clean that electrode and try again. And chances are that that's what your, your problem was. Um, at what, so we just talked about that. At what point do we stop to sharpen? Um, so filing and sanding does not affect it is what Marianne asked. So, Again, I'm gonna file and sand away any of that excess. I'm gonna file and sand away any of that surface texture. And as long as I have a deep enough weld, one that penetrated enough to do that weld, then no, it won't affect it unless I go too deep. And you guys will actually see here, I'm gonna go back and hit a couple of spots again because when I was sanding, I did go too deep and I was starting to see the seam come back up again. Um, can you only do the seams? No way of using it for sweat soldering. Um, uh, Julie, I'm not totally sure what you mean by that. Um, but you can do seams. You can do, I can do lots of things with it. If you guys have had a chance to watch my Instagram page, I'm metalsmith Melissa on Instagram. And I show a number of different ways that I use the welder for that. Does the metal need any special cleaning prior to welding? No, it does not. Uh, do the weld spots need to be removed when adding the test piece to the sweeps? No, that's the thing that's really cool about it. You guys are going to see like the metal, it kind of turns dark and black and whatever. It's soot. 
it wipes right off. Okay, so with your welder, they send a little fiberglass brush and you can just brush it off. And you guys will see that coming up here in just a second. Uh, but no, you don't have to clean anything on it. It's lovely. Uh, I do like that. Uh, let's see, what shape do I use most for the silver on my agitation? I usually am either at a triangle or a square for my shape, but I think more often than not, I'm triangle. I'd have to look again. Can it do what a laser can do? And can what can the laser do? So that is like a whole other can of worms and then with, we just don't have enough time to talk about that here. So Linda, we can talk about that um, a little bit. They don't replace each other, but there are definitely, like the, the arc welder will do better with copper and silver than the laser will, uh, hands down. So power supply on my machine is a 110. And do I patina after the welding? Absolutely. Uh, does the tungsten weld blend in? Yes, as long as you have done it. Oh yeah, and there is a, um, there is a paper that they have, and it looks like Scott just posted an article, a link to the article on pulse arc welders versus the laser welders. So Linda, be sure to check that out as well. Um, is this better for ring repairs versus soldering? I don't have enough experience to be able to answer that for doing ring repairs. Um, I know that there are things that it would do well with that, and I know people who do ring repairs with welding versus soldering. And they, you know, they like that as well. Um, so, you know, again, trial and error type of thing, I think right there. Uh, let's see, yes, we can patina afterwards. And um, do we find small explosions happen from a dirty tip? Yes, I do. Be with, especially if you have a combination of a dirty tip and too much power. Uh, the little explosions happen more because of too much power than the dirty tip though. So if you're getting the little explosions and things popping off and you guys, my little desktop over here, my bench top is totally pockmarked with little burn spots. <laughs> okay. And I even get them sometimes on my arms if I've got my power too high and I'm blowing off, uh, some of that excess metal. So, um, What's my say? We talked about that. An anti splatter spray, not that I know of. An anti splatter spray, that would be kind of awesome for sure. Uh, let's see. Can we use the welder with gold? Oh my goodness. The welder and gold love each other so much. Um, when welding a piece of copper to silver, do I use copper or silver setting? It depends on which piece is bigger or thicker. And really, you, you can use either one and it won't matter. Uh, but if I have, let's say 20 gauge copper and only a 22 gauge silver, I'm going to hit the copper setting. Okay. So hopefully that helps with that too. Uh, can you anodize the titanium after welding? Yes. Yeah. You should be able to just without a problem. Um, okay. So let's go back over to the video real quick. And we've got about 10 minutes left on that and we'll finish that up. All right. Okay, so here again, I'm just gonna use that little belt sander to kind of clean things up. Notice that, you know, at this point, things are looking pretty good. Uh, here's where I was talking about that fiberglass. See, look at that, it just brushes right off. So that's one of the things that I really like about this is that it's not, it's not like deep oxidation, like what we have with uh, soldering. Right, so this is just a fiberglass brush and I can just brush that all right off. Okay, all right. Um, I didn't realize I put so much of this on here, but there we go. So I noticed that when I did my welding, or, or not my welding, my sanding, my seam, I was starting to be able to see my seam a little bit. So I just go back in and just touch that up. Uh, this, you can even set this at a little bit lower setting, but I believe I left this on a 40. Uh, so again, it still is going to give me a nice deep weld, but notice that my surface, it's not as bad this time. Okay. Um, like last time I had a lot of deeper areas. And so now I just come back onto this and clean it back up and everything is looking nice. 
as far as my steam goes. And so I just get to spend the time here now finishing up that seam making sure everything is solid now i'm knocking off kind of that that upper surface and lower i decided to do this with a file rather than the belt sander just because i had a little bit more control so in this case this is my bale i've already engraved it and again i'm going to use that belt sander just to kind of smooth out my edges now this is where i really get my nails <laughs> This will really take your nails down really fast. And you can see I've hit it with the, the sander on that as well. So the I just want to kind of get that bale um, with a good shape. And then I'm going to go over and form it. Now for forming this, I have a number of options. And I have to be very careful because I've engraved this already. And not only is it engraved, but it's a bright cut. So it's a little bit more fragile. So here I'm using the Durston ring bender. The 08 means that it's an eight millimeter peg that I'm forming this on, okay? And I'm using the Delrin former, and that's nice because then it doesn't damage my engraved surface at all, okay? Now, the next thing that I need to do on this is I don't want those ends to continue to point down towards each other, so I flare them out just a little bit, and this is gonna allow it to sit up next to my stone, or, or next to my piece, nicely without scratching it. So I just use a ball burr to mark, you know, and give myself a divot for drilling through. This is a one millimeter drill bit, so that's 18 gauge that I'm going through this, and I just wanna go through both sides of this. and. What's going to end up happening on here is I'm going to, and I flipped it over and just went through the, the back hole as well. Just make sure that my hole is nice and open uh, and my, it will accept the wire and be able to move freely. Okay, so I'm going to be putting a little pin through this so that then this will swing. So I just use that as my point, you know, my marker um, as to where to do on the pendant where to drill. So now same method, I'm gonna use a ball burr to create um, my little divot. And that's easier said than done sometimes, especially when you're on this curved surface because it'll kind of drag a little bit and it'll catch. So you just wanna find a location, see how it drags, <laughs> it catches and pulls itself out. So I had to kind of try a couple different positions to be able to hold it still um, while I did that little divot. And then once again, I'm gonna drill through this. Now notice that I'm working on a piece of leather here, and that's because I don't want to get a whole ton of scratches on my piece from my bench pin. Okay, so you can use some kind of a soft cloth or whatever, and this is just the suede side of a piece of leather that I have. And you'll see when I get to polishing, I'm gonna use a couple different things on here, okay? And here I'm gonna start off with a felt buff. This is hard, and I'm using platinum white. And if you remember that platinum white is a little bit gritty, okay? So you can see those surface scratches right there from the, the file and stuff in the sanding. And now you don't, because they're gone. Look how pretty that is. And this again is where we're really going to see if we have a good weld at our seam. And we have a beautiful weld at our seam. Okay, and so again, I'm just doing the platinum white. I'm just doing here along the edge. And now on this piece, I wanted the front of the piece to be a little bit more matte finish so that my engraving work really, really pops. But on the back, I want it to have a nice mirror finish. So I'm gonna go over this also with the felt and remove any of those small surface scratches that might have happened while sitting on a bench pin or whatever other operation that I have on this piece. Um, so from here, I'm gonna go ahead and use this with that platinum white, remove the scratches, and then I'm gonna move it over to um, a high finish with a red rouge. But I actually might wait for that a little bit. Here it's also important to remember, if you guys are gonna do any of these polishing steps, you need to make certain that you clean your piece really well between the steps, because you don't want to cross contaminate uh, the different grits, because if you have 180 grit and you leave some of those grits on there, even though you might go to a 3000 grit paper, it still is going to be bad. Oh, 
check out that electrode. That electrode is terrible. That should have been cleaned. But I was like, ah, I can do it. <laughs> Notice that I'm kind of stabilizing my finger there too. So here I've balled up one end. This is that pin that I was telling you about. Push it through. We're gonna cut it down to size. And everybody always asks, how, how tight do you make it? And that's just, and here I was also gonna tighten up that bale just a little bit. But I like to leave probably about three millimeters or so. Um, now here, remember I said I'm not gonna clip it? I'm just holding it. I'm holding it up against the bale. All right, tack one, tack two. And there is our beautiful ball. That's the other thing too. These welders make a perfect ball on, on, these, um, on the sterling silver wire, which is not easy to do. So now that I'm done, now I go back with my red rouge on a soft, or soft cotton buff. Notice that the surface that I'm holding my piece on is now different, so I've just flipped it over. So one side I do, uh, the gritty ones, and then the other side, I do the high polish. And every now and then you can see me in there. Hello! But this is how I go through that piece. So there's a lot of steps to it. And like I said, this was a three hours of video that I was able to take down to 30 minutes. And this is now our piece. Okay, and again, like I said, my favorite thing is that I'm able to do this more complex covering over the stones that I wouldn't have been able to do by soldering because if I did I wouldn't be able to set the stone or if I set my stone I couldn't do the soldering and not only that but hitting this with a torch after I've done all the engraving would undo a lot and that's the seam check out that seam beautiful there is no seam it's just solid and so you would never even know how it had been put together okay and that, you guys, is the end of our video. So let's finish up any more questions. And thank you. It looks like you guys are liking this piece. I love this piece. It, it's definitely, and it's got a lot of fun movement on it. So it's definitely a great one. Amber just asked, when you have to add silver, do you use 28 gauge wire? I do. And actually I leave that like right here at my welder. Like I always have a little bit here. Um, Sometimes I'll use fine, sometimes I'll use sterling, it just kind of depends. But yeah, so in, in the case of my pendant, I didn't have to add anything because I left enough of a flange around it. But when I have, sometimes I'm doing a jump ring or an ear, ear wire type of thing, then I can add a little bit of wire because sometimes you need a little bit of, of extra material and that's where I will then introduce. Because I think somebody asked about fire wire. Fire wire is something that they use in the lasers and that will work just fine here on the welder also. So um, you, have, you do have that as a possibility. Uh, can this type of item be done with thinner gauge if you have uh, the lesser impulse? The impulse, you're still going to have a really hard time. It just does not have the kind of wattage that you need to get a really good joint on that. But that said, absolutely try it. Try it and see what happens. Uh, can we suggest the welder name, please? This Mine is the 200i. Um, we mentioned that I have other videos where they can be seen. Out on Instagram, I have a number of videos and I will be putting some more out on my YouTube channel as well. On Instagram, I'm Metalsmith Melissa. On YouTube, it's just Melissa Muir, so you can find me there as well. Um, Argentium, yes, it will work very well on Argentium also, so you should be able to do that. Uh, Camille asked, is the electrode to make contact with the piece or just held off of the electrode? Uh, no, it makes contact with the piece. So what happens, and I have a, a cool video that shows this out on my YouTube channel. Um, so what happens is your electrode, you touch it, and that creates that circuit. The electrode, so the gas will begin to flow, that argon begins to flow. The electrode is gonna retract, 
and then the that plasma arc is going to come down and jump the gap between your electrode and your piece and then the electrode will come back down i mean and it happens it happens so fast you barely see it but if you did see like on my video like when i had the welds you kind of see this okay and so that might be something to look for uh if you watch it again uh, the name of the Fordham carving tip, these are a tungsten carbide carving tip is what I used. Now, like I said, Fordham, I don't believe that they have any of these in stock yet, but they're getting them in. So that's something that we can watch for as well. Can it be used on brass? Silly question, but what color will the seam be? Yes, it can be used on brass uh, and your seam will be brass because all you're doing is you're melting you're fusing basically the two sides or whatever your join is going to be. Okay, so Bobby asked the brand name. These are Orion uh, arc welders. They're from Sunstone Engineering. So Sunstone Engineering is the company that makes the welders. They have lasers, they've got the arc welders, they have engraving machines as well. So we're gonna be at JCK. I will be there as well, uh, demoing the Pulse arc welders. So make sure you come by and see hi. Uh, 55068 is our booth, um, and then we should have the full line of welders there as well as some of the lasers and, and see like that. Um, if you guys are interested in learning more about micro welding, then remember they've got the micro welding conference in Orlando at the end of September, first part of October. So that should be really cool. And you can check the Sunstone engineering website for more information on that. And again, thank you to Potter USA and to Fordham Electric, as well as micro tools for helping to co-sponsor us. You guys, if you have questions, just let us know. Uh, most of you guys know how to get a hold of me through email, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I'm all over the place. Google me. I'm like the first 10 pages. You'll find me. So if you guys have any questions, just let us know and we'll get back to you uh, as quickly as we can on some of that. So, uh, Scott, anything else that we need to cover? No, I think we're good to go. Thank you everyone for joining. This has been awesome. Again, just to reiterate what's been said, any questions, feel free to reach out to Melissa or anyone at Sunstone if you have uh, welding specific questions. Obviously, if you have jewelry making questions that are outside of welding, I would I would contact Melissa. <laughs> there. But uh, if you have any welding questions, contact us. Uh, you can hit us up on Instagram. You can email us uh, info at sunstonewelders.com. Yep. And thank you guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it.